to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go! So today our guest is Daniel Greaves. He founded a specialist cold email marketing business that is a mix of a service and proprietary tech. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for making the time. Hi, Tatiana. Thanks so much for, for having me. And let's start a bit um, with an introduction. Tell me a bit about yourself. So I, I've always um, been in kind of sales and, and actually started out in finance. Started out in the stockbroking, the institutional stockbroking industry. Um, and in stockbroking, this is basically you're trying to convince the the people who manage the most money on what stocks to buy. Um, and I was like a very young, inexperienced finance graduate trying to convince these these uh, very rich portfolio managers and smart people on what stocks to buy. Um, obviously supported by analysts, and and that was how I got thrown into the the kind of deep end of sales very fast. Um, and my natural response was to try and get analytical to solve the problems rather than um, rather than keep throwing whatever I could against the wall until something sticks. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, then, I, then that evolved into, into commercial property sales with property funds. Uh, then, I, then I eventually made my way into the startup world. And every time I kind of moved jobs, I was like, okay, this is my last job. I'm going to start a business. This is my last job. I'm going to start a business. <laughs> And then finally, I did um, had had a casual chat with a friend of a friend over a beer, and he gave me some very little um, kind of funding to kind of keep myself going for six months, uh, and that was the birth of of Fuel to Fly. And uh, now, three years later, we are uh, we've built some really really cool things. We had a, we had a meeting last week, just kind of looking back. So that's actually our third birthday next week. Uh, just looking back at everything that we've done, and it's uh, it was a really nice, really nice to see what we've created over the years. So, what does tell me what does Field to Fly do? So, we focus purely on B two B cold email outreach. That's like our core competency, our bread and butter, if you want to call it that. Uh, we've definitely seen over the years the market become a bit more saturated with cold email service providers. <laughs> And what we've done to kind of what we've done to remain blue ocean is really focus on the data side. So we've built a front end that focuses really on which on giving you data feedback as to how your outreach is performing. We found a lot of our competitors are these like black box services where they'll say they run outreach for you and you kind of don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've provided a, a front end where we show you exactly. What's, what's happening, we show you which personas are showing the most interest, which copy is working. And then we also provide a very consultative account, uh, account manager that works with you quite closely on suggesting based on the data, what sequences you need to iterate on, what needs to change, what's working, what isn't. And then what we do very differently now is uh, everything is done on the fly. So the way we prospect is typical typical tools like Apollo, LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, all of those things. But we don't do this like batch, find a huge list of people, find the emails, throw them into a campaign, press play and hope for the best. Uh, We've actually built tech that basically pulls people from a specific search and adds a certain amount of people within that search on a daily basis. So you might be adding people, 100 people a day or 200 people a day. And then as results come in, we can tweak, okay, this persona is working, this isn't. Maybe in smaller companies, we need to focus on higher level people, bigger companies, not so much. Mm-hmm. And then as as we go, we've just embraced that it's not a cold outreach, it's not a leads on a plate or deals on a plate kind of approach. Uh, you actually have to look at it in a very analytical way because there's a lot of data that gets provided. Mm. Um, and so that's that's been really our approach. And over the years, we've just, it's been more of a vision and now we're really realizing that as the tech that we've been building 
uh, is coming to life. And I'm going to get back to more about what you do and how you do it. But before that, tell me, how did you come up with the name Fuel to Fly? Uh, to be honest, I was looking for, for what dot coms I could get. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I was just sitting on the couch in the lounge on um, on GoDaddy and just you know guessing and and it just the 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 name just kind of I don't know how it just came popped into my head and it made sense and what I also thought was that you know if the business doesn't work out or something happens the name is quite um, is quite broad like feel to fly can. You can run any kind of business with almost any kind of business with that name. Yeah. Um, some people think some people have approached me or cold emailed me thinking that we are like a fuel company. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so it was quite broad. Like you could, you could spin that in many ways. And then as soon as I typed it in, the dot com was there. It cost me $8 a year. And, um, and then it was a no brainer. As soon as I saw the dot com, I was like, okay, this is a good name. Hmm. Yeah, that was that was quite lucky. It's a it's a good meaningful name, like you say. It's not limiting in any way. You can apply to anything, and 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 it's also it comes with a backstory of its own. Like you you don't really need to explain much what you stand for when when yeah you yeah yeah and it, yeah it fits it fits quite nicely. Um, the only thing is now that everyone's moving away from fossil fuels and it gets associated with with that, but. But oh, yeah. hopefully that's okay. Well, you're assigning it your own meaning, yeah. So yeah. cold email is is like as I guess pretty much as old as as old as email. You know, before we had email and the internet, you had like people uh, cold calling and knocking on doors. So that's effectively the online version of that. And in a very similar way to to cold calling, it like it it has that reputation of everybody does it, but everybody hates it. So, yeah. how, yeah, um, like, literally, I mean, I don't think you would, you can talk to somebody saying, oh, do you like being called cold or cold email? And everybody goes, no, but then you have to do it when you run a business because, you know, you have to reach people somehow. Um, so how, how do you deal with that? How, and how, what would you suggest for people that are at that stage in their business where they have to, they're thinking of ways to generate business and they go, okay, I have to do cold emails. Yeah, that's, that's such a good question. Um, and to be honest, the, what people tend to do when they think of cold email is they think of, they think of it as a sales function and it, it definitely is, but what they do is as soon as they, it pops into, it's a very psychological thing. As soon as it pops into their head that, okay, this is a sale. I need to get leads and close these and close deals with these leads. And I can do it by a cold email as a channel. Uh, whereas our approach is, if you think of it like like knocking on a door, the cold email is simply the knock on the door. It's not the open on the door. It's not the discussion that happens afterwards. That's like that's your call. That's your meeting. That's everything later on in the pipeline. So what we focus on is just having a really really good door knock essentially. So. That number that which and the the key thing there is when you're knocking on a door is you're not selling. So the number one thing is that we that we try and embody in our cold outreach is to not sell at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's simply we try to try to get to the, get through to the right people that resonate with a pain point and and simply ask for more information like hey is this something uh, that resonates with you if not that's okay if so let me know we can send you more information. Mm. Uh, there's and and that's like the been been very key and very helpful and it's also been important to educate the market because we obviously we write the copy for our um, for our clients and there's a lot of like back and forth because we'll write very simple 60 70 word emails that is essentially a door knock and they'll come back and want to s- squeeze and close the deal in the email yeah and make and make it super salesy etc and um, and there's a lot of education that that goes into into that and expectation management at the beginning of of a relationship. I was gonna, yeah, that was gonna be my next question, and you kind of started answering it already. Was gonna be what is the biggest mistake you see entrepreneurs make when it comes to cold email? So I guess one of them would be that expecting to do everything in in the first email. Yeah, so that's that's the one. I would argue there's there's an even bigger one, which is email deliverability. 
So mm-hmm. another another thing that obviously comes back to the the domain the domain name world is um, especially Gmail and Microsoft they've got highly advanced spam filters and they don't tell you how uh, how they put you in, in spam. Mm. Um, but what's what's very important <laughs> is a lot of a big mistake sales teams make is num- number one outbound has become very technical now that we have sales navigator and apollo and zoom info and all this intent data and it's like it's a full-on art now like writing good copy and prospecting and a lot of companies are still giving their like lower level inexperienced sdrs the job of outbound mm. and then what happens is first they just connect, they'll get a tool like Apollo or Mailshake or whatever. They connect their Gmail accounts and they just start emailing. It, it automatically puts them on 400 emails a day. Um, they, don't clean their, they don't clean their lists or they acquire their data in, a, in an interesting way. And then what happens is they use their primary domain and then they put the whole, company, the whole company's domain um, pretty much in, in the trash can. And then everyone starts landing in spam. Nice. Um, so, so what, a, what a lot of people do is they buy a domain, like a different domain name. There, there is an issue with that, whereas if you have a new domain, you're kind of already automatically in some blacklists just mm. because the domain is new. Because that's what spammers do. They just buy domains, email the world, the domain goes to trash, they buy another one they and do it again. So, so our approach has been more subdomains because then you leverage the the age of the primary domain, we connect the subdomain, uh, the, the, the customer points the subdomain to our server, and then we have a deliverability team that sets it up um, in the best best kind of way possible. And then the nice thing is, any if there is any damage done to the subdomain, it doesn't impact the reputation of the primary mm-hmm. domain. So yeah, that, then, that seems a lot more complicated than just, oh, we get a bunch of emails and we send them out. And um, I, I want to highlight that um, because it, it is something that I see quite a bit with domains where people go, oh, it's just a domain name. I'll just get my you know nephew, cousin, whatever to register it and it works. And we, I mean, the importance that the domain name has for a brand and the, the, the email and the outreach has for a brand is, is so enormous that it's really important, I, I feel, for entrepreneurs to understand that and to have the right people dealing with those things in their company. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And and what we've also found is what's changing now in the deliverability space is these filters are very much looking at the actual copy in your emails. Mm. So even if you have a good domain, good reputation, everything is fantastic. Um, but you send an email saying, hey, you've won the lottery, call us now today. Um, or come, you have... You know, you've got a, you've inherited money from a Nigerian prince. Yeah. <laughs> then, uh, then they'll pick up on that language and and throw you straight to spam. But, but it gets more advanced than that. Like there's specific words. If you have too many of them in the copy, if if you have the word like product demo in your subject line, that's already a little bit risky. Um, so there's a huge amount of thought that also has to just go into the wording, and that also enforces the idea of like, okay, don't sell because it also impacts your deliverability. Mm. So, yeah. So if I understand correctly, what should be the right approach is more exactly like you said, I think you really nicely illustrated it there with the knock on the door. It's just saying, you know, hi, that's what we're doing. And if you want to, or if that's relevant to you, then we can talk further, but that doesn't happen on the first email. Yeah, exactly. And and it's it's almost like, when you knock on the door, all you can see is the kind of like outside of the house, and you can you can add you can use like a pain point. You know, if they have a broken window, you can be like knock on the door and, and slide an alert under the door and say, "Hey, your window is broken. We can fix it." They mm-hmm. can decide whether to open it or yeah, not. That's a really um, good analogy. So, so you know, yeah. with with the 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 content as well with the copy of the emails. Yeah, yeah, we've got we've got a team of three writers. Uh, and one of them is just an analyst. He just focuses on, he actually studied neuro, neuroscience and, and oh. then moved into physics. And he's just so passionate about the, this kind of stuff. So uh, he just analyzes A-B tests and we iterate on, on those things. 
Um, and then, yeah, our, our other two writers are very focused on just making sure copy works. So how does the process go? So somebody can yeah, let me backtrack that actually. Who would be the, the, the right, what type of company, what type of entrepreneur and at what stage would it be best for them to contact you? you? Yeah, that's, that's a good question because like email is, is how people just do business, right? Mm. Um, so as soon as you need to scale any type of email, uh, you can you can work with us. So we've done like crypto token launches. We've done we've helped VCs raise funds. Uh, we've helped startups raise funds. We've done normal like software as a service B two B outreach. We've helped like more tangible food and beverage products uh, reach out. We've reached out to supermarkets to get their products on shelves and into distributors' warehouses. Uh, we've done very early stage businesses. We've done very big businesses that have a, that have a lot of funding. Um, we've done we've worked with COVID testing companies that need to get into the B two B space as well. So, so it's it's it is very it's very very broad. Um, so it's a, it's a tough question to answer, but we've definitely found that cold outreach works better in certain spaces, mm. and it. For us, it works better if you're emailing people that don't get absolutely bombarded with cold outreach. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you think of your obvious ones and, and people have that data available now with Crunchbase is like a B2B SaaS business that has recently received a boatload of funding. Like they get absolutely bombarded. So we don't even... And so many of our customers will come to us and be like, hey, we want to reach out to customers that have recently received funding. And we just... Mm-hmm. We immediately say no. It's not going to work. Mm. Um, that was going to be another question. Yeah, how how do you how much do you get involved on on that? How does that process go? Of you know, somebody comes uh, up to you with, okay, that's what we're going to do. How do you mold that into what you believe will actually work? Yeah, another. If you're asking so, so many good questions, Tatiana. <laughs> so so, it's a very collaborative process because every customer is different. <laughs> So where we kind of start is we look at, we talk about their product uh, and we talk about their addressable market as a whole. And then what we do is, is we start segmenting. We work with them to segment their market into pieces, right? Um, so I can, for example, I can talk in the, in the, in the case of fuel to fly. We've, we've found that when we reach out when we have customers that are reaching out to like hotels or people in the hospitality space, it works really well. Uh, when we work, when we reach out to companies, when we help VCs raise funds, it works really well. And then we, in, those are like two different market segments for us. And we have to frame our messaging to those different market segments very differently, obviously. Mm-hmm. Like to VCs, we don't even say that we're a B2B lead generation business. Mm. We say, we say we're a we're an outreach company that helps you expand uh, your network of LPs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so addressing a very specific pain point there. Yeah. Goal. Yeah. Yeah. And and a nice example we have is is if you think on it's it's all about how you frame your offering for the persona. So I recently watched the the release of like the new Apple uh, iPhones and Apple products. Mm. And what they did was quite cool. So the the thing about themselves was that, hey, we have this, the fastest chip in a phone. Mm. But if, you, if you're reaching out to photographers, you can say that enables you to process much higher res mm-hmm. pictures much faster. And it enables us to layer the pictures very differently that we've never been able to do before. Mm. Yeah. Because if you told the photographer, hey, get our phone, we've got the fastest chip ever. That means nothing to them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Apple are very good. Well, it's not an accident, you know, they are who they are. But yeah, they're very, very good at that, um, at, at addressing exactly the, and even turning things that you would see as a negative to their advantage. I, re- I remember it's one of my favorite um, adverts they had with, a kid, a teenager, sort of an age that spends all their time on their phone uh, on a holiday, and then, but the end of the advert is actually they they play a video that they've made a little film about the family, 
and everybody's yes. like together around it and so lovely and it's like wow and and it, it's like literally you don't have a parent who is not worried about their kid spending too much time on their phone and they turn it into an advantage in like yeah but they can do creative things with it that you know a good thing for the whole family and for their development as well it's like yeah you did it again <laughs> it's yeah like, they they really have an interesting strategy and like it was cool watching the 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 launch now it was all about like say it was all about like safety for example like all of their products had this these like satellite safety tracking and uh, and these and like increased um like accident like if you have a car accident your phone will mm-hmm. tell you you've been in an accident and then let people know and i think it's just because they time that well because people are so much more cautious and almost afraid but coming out of covid and into like this climate mm-hmm. change world and everyone's Everyone's in a in a very anxious space, so I think they hit yeah. that that mark really well. That was that was definitely the last thing was definitely a, a much very different from usually. It's all positive and all dreams and all aspirations, and now it was like all like you said, it's all safety protection. Um, I think they even had some type of a tagline like that. It was like we hope you're never gonna need all those features, but yes. if it, happens, it can save your life. Yeah, yeah. very good. It is, yeah. yeah. Talking about because that really is a good example of how a business is reacting to to the environment and to changing consumers. You've been in 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 sales and marketing and cold email for for quite a bit of time now. Would you say there are some trends? There are some things that you see changing in in outreach and cold outreach in general. Yeah, de- definitely. I think when I initially started, because cold email wasn't as much of a as much of a thing, you could get away with a pretty bad salesy email. Mm. Um, and and now your email has to. So there's a lot of changes in the copy for sure, uh, and it, and it just goes into more of like that not selling, being more personalized and being more targeted. Um, and then the other thing is spam filters are getting mm. so smart. Um, they really are like they really are picking uh, picking emails apart now. So that's I mean like I don't really consider us consider us spam because we are very targeted and we focus on on not selling. Mm. Um, but it's almost it's almost a nice challenge um, with the spam filters because as soon as you do get too sally, you kind of Mm. Uh, you slip you slip off into into that so that's been a a big change and then the other one is we've definitely we definitely see a lot of uh, a lot of new small agencies entering the market because it is quite a low barrier to entry business um mm. you can plug some tools together you can get apollo you can get an email verification tool you can say you're an agency and learn learn basics of cold email and start helping people and learn as you go and and charge some money for it. Mm. Um, so, so there's definitely a lot more competition in the market, but everyone wants to charge crazy high prices, uh, mm-hmm. which is quite funny. <laughs> so we're trying to build tech and automation so we can actually bring our prices down and um, and kind of go the other way. How would you say is it, if it's at all possible? Because, like, let's say I'm a business owner, I want to do outreach. <laughs> I come and talk to somebody, describe what I need. I have some target market, da, da, da. Give them the job. How do I know if they're doing a good job? And generally, is there any way before even I give them the job to to know, like, questions I should ask, things I should be looking at to, to be able to make a better choice? Because like you said, like, you, you, you have the experience. Of, I mean, you have a business. You have some tech behind it. You have three people writing copy, analyzing, doing all that stuff. But people don't can't see that. I mean, you mm. you would be in competition with somebody who, who could be sitting, I don't know, in their living room and, you know, spamming people effectively. Yeah, exactly. So that's, it's um, definitely the one thing I would do is always, when you're engaging with these people, always engage with more than one. Like usually when people reach out to us, they're engaging with more than one agency. Um, so you have, you can create some sort of benchmark. Ask for an example of their copies um, for what they've done for another customer or something. They can kind of anonymize it a little bit. Then you Mm -hmm. can actually get a feel for how they're writing. Um, 
and then and then ask them quite specific questions around prospecting, and maybe pick pick like a quite a tough quite a tough segment, and say like, hey, you know, if I wanted to reach out to yoga studios in Poland where they don't speak English, how would you prospect for that? Mm. Um, and and then and then just challenge challenge them with tough things like that, and see if see if you get honest answers or, or bullshit. Mm. Um, because they, unfortunately, there is a lot of bull- bullshit out there. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, we sort of covered who can benefit from the services. Um, let's say, where do you see the, the future of outreach and cold emails? Yeah, I definitely see it's tricky because it's it's tricky because cold email is getting better and smarter. You're getting these tools that can like, scrape your LinkedIn profile and personalize an email for you. Um, but you're also getting spam filters getting becoming much smarter. And you get other other tools like Polywork that are probably cannibalizing a little bit of the outreach space. Mm. Um, so it's it's very tricky to see. But in my view is that email has always kind of stood the test of time. And so it will always play a role in some way or another. What I do think is that cold email is going to move away from being sale, a sales kind of tool to more of a, a networking kind mm. of tool. And that's what we're seeing, especially in the VC space. Uh, what we've learned is in, if, you're a, if you're a VC raising funds, you're actually not allowed to publicly disclose that you're raising a fund. Mm. Um, there's a lot of like, rules around general solicitation. So we actually have to come from an angle where we don't we don't tell potential LPs that we're raising a fund. We can talk about a previous fund that was closed mm-hmm. and the performance of that one. But the angle is very much just to like, hey, it's more of like a hey, let's be friends kind of email. And in the same way, that's the reason people go to events. Uh, they want to sign clients, but the first step is, hey, we need. I need to make some friends first, and then hopefully mm-hmm. the, some of them will, will be potential clients. So, I see the as the market kind of matures, they'll start to see cold email as more of a networking tool than a than a sales tool. Mm, definitely, really touch on domains again but where i mean there's obviously the technical side of it like you say spam filters that are based on whatever statistic and 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 things they monitor um i'm I'm sure there's like some extensions that are more likely to be considered as spam but that's on the technical side do you feel there's a difference just like people looking at an email address and saying, oh, that's more trustworthy than another. Yeah, definitely. And and spam will just look at that stuff too. Like if, if you have like a weird TLD, mm. um, like if we we had some some trouble with a company that where their TLD was .dev, for example, even though that's not such a bad one, uh, people definitely see comfort in the .coms and .ios, I would say. Mm. As, so we always encourage uh, to try and stick with those uh, those traditional, more traditional TLDs. Mm. So that would that would definitely be where I see some people seeing hesitation, and it's and it's tricky because there's there's a TLD for everything these days. Um, I was reading that that I don't know if you've heard about it, but it looks like emojis are coming into domain names soon. There was there was something actually maybe maybe a year or so ago, I don't know. And and then I, I did look at it and then it kind of disappeared. So I don't know what happened to it. Maybe it's still in the happening, but yeah, I don't I don't know what to make out after that one, to be honest. Yeah, it's quite an interesting one. And then your on the on the technical side you have your like your mail server. So on the back end, your um your spam filters will check, okay, where's your mail server? If your mail server is google.com or google gmail.com is, I think is generally the one that is used on the back end, then it's like a good reputation. So they'll also check the domain of your mail server. Um, and some are, some have better reputations than others. Like obviously Google's got some of the best reputation on the internet and Outlook, but then you get tools like SendGrid that are a little bit less reputable, but there's also pros because you can send much higher email volume. Mm. Um, so, so that's also also something to to 
take notice of. Mm. And that's something that you can advise people on, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, when you receive any email, you can always just in Gmail click like view original in, in the settings or in the three dots, and then you can see um, the SPF record and, and who they've authenticated as their, their sending server. Mm. And then you can see, oh, they're sending with Google or they're sending with SendGrid or they're sending with some dodgy server that this maybe this isn't good. Uh, mm. Yeah. Last, well, maybe not last question, but one of the last ones. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it coming up to 30 minutes and I try and keep it short. Um, okay. You are in South Africa. And you're running a global business. Most, I think most people are like when you come out of the US and, and Europe and even Europe, you know, it's not, it's seen more as a, like if I build the business somewhere that's not the US, it's going to be, you know, smaller, local. It's not, do you know what I mean? It, it, it's seen always as more something harder to achieve and to do. What is, what is your experience? Yeah, to be honest, we definitely see that location bias for sure. Uh, mm. trying to tap into the U.S. market. And we've become quite close with our some of our U.S. competitors. We all talk to each other. Um, and we definitely see location bias, even though we tend to beat them on price, most of our competitors on price. Um, it's, yeah, it's, there's there's always a bit of hesitant, like a bit more comfort for, for clients to work with someone in mm. their own country. So we've definitely seen that. Uh, what we have done is we have opened like a US subsidiary. Uh, we have we have hired some US consultants and we have people on the ground in the US that help with referrals. Yeah. Um, but that's mostly how we've combated it. Uh, but it's definitely, definitely has been uh, something that we've had to, a hurdle for us that, I, that I'd consider. And it was interesting because I thought it wouldn't be. I thought everyone was, mm. you know, fine to work globally and, and it was cool that, that we're based in Africa and, and things like that. Um, but we definitely, definitely see it. There's definitely some like connotations or. I would have, yeah. yeah. That, that's funny because I started in IT. I had an IT development, so we were building websites and software more than 15 years ago. But we yeah, have 15 ish years ago, and at the time. Um, I was in Eastern Europe and we were mainly working with English market, anybody speaking English, um, US and UK. And that was an issue then. People were like, oh, no, no, I want somebody mm. to go. And it's like, yeah, but if you're, I mean, if there's a problem with your website, I'm not going to come to your house to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you, you, have you found something similar? <laughs> yeah, but I, that was 15 years ago. I would have thought that's yeah. gone by now, but apparently not. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it also depends on the client. Like we still work with some some pretty old school customers. Like mm. we've worked with customers who work only like dental marketing companies. Um, they also there's 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 some old school industries out there, but I wouldn't limit it limit it to them. Um, there's maybe like I don't know, maybe this like American and UK kind of like clique that that they want to support their own industries and. Hmm. And to to be honest, it's it's a it's a nice challenge to have, and it's really challenged us to to let our product do the work, right? Hmm. And so a lot of the time when we when we show our product, that kind of does the work for us. It's like yeah, we're 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 not we we don't kind of tick your location bias box, but our product is ten times better, and we're priced better, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's. That's been a nice challenge because it's forced us to to really differentiate. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's like when when your product does the work better and and you can offer a better or competitive price, then you know it's it takes that problem with the location completely off the table. Yeah, and if we didn't have this like location thing, we probably wouldn't have been as driven to innovate as as hard as we do. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So what's next? What's next for Fieldfly? What's next? I think uh, we've, I mean, for me as a, as a founder, it always feels like there's still so much to do and to build. Uh, the, the product, in my mind, I mean, we've come a long way. There's still so much to do. But we just, we just want to give the, the customer more power and agency. So there's a, 
right now, when you're working with an agency, you always have to go to the account manager, like, hey, please mark these contacts as do not contact We're working with this company. Or, hey, like, let's, we, we've seen in your dashboard now that you can provide this information that this persona is not working. Please, can we stop reaching out to them? We want to make that more of a, give the, give the customer more agency to do that. So, um, basically becoming more of a self-service intelligence uh, yeah. outreach outreach intelligence tool and move away from the, the kind of service part and into a product. And then, then much later, the idea is hopefully to build integrations with all of the outreach tools um, and data providers like your kind of Zoom Info, Apollo, Outreach.io, Mailshake, all of them. And then we sit in the middle as like this outreach analytics tool. Mm. And you can kind of, as a sales team, connect what you're using, get advice on on copy and prospecting, and then uh, and then let the, let the data do the work and the tool make the suggestions. Nice. So we have some some way to go. Def- definitely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, well, uh, that that was it. That was it. It's been very interesting. Where can people reach you? Uh, just th- through our website, fieldsfly.com. Um, Everything is, there's a lot of good information there. Uh, you, there's a little chat bot as well. You can reach out to to our team through there um, or, or on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn um, and obviously Polywork as well. And um, yeah, those are those are pretty much the, the normal channels. And, um, and yeah. Great. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, and yeah. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Thank you too. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Smart Branding Podcast. Feel free to visit smartbranding.com for more information and reach out if you have any suggestions, questions, ideas, or just want to learn more about how a good domain name strategy can help you build a strong and successful brand. See you next time.